Here's a quick blast through HMRC's new guidelines for irony tax credit claims, what you need to know. My name is Steve Livingston from IP Tax Solutions and introducing the new guidelines, they're called the Guidelines for Compliance for RD Tax Credit Claims. They're published 31st of October 2023 to clarify the process for companies, claimant companies, and it's very hot off the press when I'm recording this mid-November 2023. And I think it's pretty much essential that any company that is claiming R&D tax relief needs to be aware of these guidelines as I think they will become increasingly relied upon by HMRC and their caseworkers. So quick blast through I think is time well spent here. So in terms of comparison with previous guidelines and the sort of relevance they have, first and foremost should say these are not statutory. This is HMRC's guidance, so there can be differences from the law, potentially. Uh, HMRC take a view, and this is their view at this time, and there may be certain areas as we run through where it does raise questions about their approach and where they're relying. So just be aware it's non-statutory, but it will be, I think a lot of reliance will be placed on this by HMRC. So they do not replace the existing 2004 BIS guidelines, and they're reproducing, let's say, certain parts of the guidelines and omitting others. As I say, we'll come on to that in a moment. In terms of quoting HMRC, they say, these guidelines for compliance expand on HMRC's view of the guidelines on the meaning of R&D for tax purposes. They say, unfortunately, we continue to see many misunderstandings of what is and is not research and development under the relevant guidelines. And these guidelines for compliance expand on our existing guidance on the relevant R&D guidelines, but do not change our view of the law. And again, I think there's some question marks I'm recording this over HMRC's interpretation of the law in certain specific areas, but they don't really go there in terms of this guidelines here. What's the gui- what's the motivation for these changes? Well, uh, you know, it's it's been fairly well documented in the press that there has been a massive upsurge in the number of claims that have gone through, uh, been made to HMRC. They've been overwhelmed by the sheer volume and numbers. Therefore, many, many got processed, which probably shouldn't have been. Um, I think at some certain stages there were very uh, high profile fraud cases and now HMRC suspect there's quite a lot of boundary pushing and claims are going in for certain areas, uh, certain um, industries and companies that aren't undertaking R&D as should be applied in this case. Now uh, they are currently massively clamping down. The number of inquiries has rocketed. They've got a raft of new uh, caseworkers and inspectors working on uh, inquiring and challenging certain claims, which was needed for sure because it was getting out of hand. But at, at the moment, fortunately, we've kind of swung too far the other way because a lot of legitimate companies are being caught up in inquiries when they shouldn't be and they're being challenged when they shouldn't be. And some are being rejected when they shouldn't be. I think a lot of other companies with smaller claims are just deciding to throw the towel in because they can't, don't have the time nor uh, patience to run through rounds and rounds of correspondence with HMRC. So HMRC are chalking this up as a win, thinking they've got more and more areas of uh, areas of error and fraud um, when this is not necessarily the case. And we'll see figures from HMRC in the near future, which I think will be misleading because I don't think that number of claims were in error they're going to be skewed, but never mind. This, we are where we are. Uh, we'll keep fighting it, certainly from my corner anyway. Okay, so in terms of uh, so the motivation, that's why uh, we're seeing more guidance. And as I said, I quoted a moment ago, HMRC is saying we're seeing misunderstandings of what is and isn't R&D. Fine, okay. So the key changes that we're seeing from this new extended guidance, and I urge you to read it. I've got a link to it, but um, I'm just trying to sort of give you the, the kind of highlights here. One area is around documentation. And we're seeing a much stronger emphasis here on documenting the advance of the R&D in real time or, if possible, kind of in advance of the advance, uh, pardon the pun. What they say here is, um, I'm just quoting from them, they're saying, HMRC consider that claims to R&D relief are more likely to be correct if the company is aware at the time that the work is doing that it is doing may qualify for a tax relief. So what we're kind of seeing here is that shift away from that kind of retrospective going back and going and digging over projects that you didn't really think were necessarily R&D, but now thinking, oh, I never knew I was doing R&D, that kind of approach. We're going to see a shift away from that, I think, where it's going to be much more real time and uh, documenting claims as you go along, documenting the reporting side of it anyway, to capture it in real time so you've got it to hand. And I think what you'll see from this as we run through this, 
I think if you can comply with these rules as much as possible, because I think inspectors will lean on it more and more, then it makes it more and more difficult for HMRC to deny the claim. Because if you say, look, look, I've documented it on the way through the process very, very clearly, as you asked me to do in your guidance for com uh, guidelines for compliance and on our anti-tax credits issued in October 2023. If you can show that you've, you've ticked these boxes, it becomes more difficult, I think, for them to say, uh, to deny the claims, because this is what they're asking for. So in terms of specific actions, they're saying, number one, consider if you're planning to do something that may need new knowledge or techniques in a qualifying field of science or technology. Point two, write down exactly what advances you are seeking. So this is like in real time, what are you seeking to do? Point three, write down exactly which uncertainties you need to resolve and the steps you plan to take to resolve them. The written plan should be in proportion to the amount of work needed and the amount of expense you expect. There is no need to write a 10 page plan for a project if a page of bullet points covers all the steps. We'd expect you to already have detailed records of large or expensive projects. So there may be no need to write out a separate plan. Point four, get the opinion of a competent professional in the field. Often someone suitable already works on the projects. Uh, often someone suitable already works on the projects, so perhaps someone internally. The opinion should set out the information listed in the, I'll come into a section, importance of competent professionals. Um, the opinion does not need to be longer than needed to briefly set out relevant facts and reasoning, but a simple assertion that the project qualifies as an advance will not be enough. Both you and HMRC need to understand, firstly, the extent of the work, secondly, what made it a project to resolve a specified uncertainty, three, how the project sought an advance in a qualifying area of science or technology, and four, where work to achieve the advance began and ended. Be specific to say you are seeking an advance in the field of engineering would be too vague. You should name the field and subfield if appropriate, set out the advance you seek, set out exactly what uncertainties you need to overcome and say how the project advances the current state of knowledge in that field. Keep a written copy of the competent professional's opinion with supporting reasoning. Include the relevant qualifications and experience of the competent professional. Without a written record, you may struggle to show evidence of your claim to HMRC if the competent professional is unavailable. And this is something we see sometimes where you do retrospective claims. So I'm, I'm moving away from that. There's specific quoted guidance there. Um, when we're looking at retrospective claims, sometimes we find that you know people have moved on, um, and you know they, your kind of CTO or, or you know someone who's leading a project has moved on to another company, and that knowledge and support is gone. So getting that. Uh, evidence written down i mean it completely makes sense uh, there's, there's nothing kind of rocket science here but we're going to just understand we're going to see a shift towards this where hmrc expect to see much more documents and they even go on to say things like um you know in the event of an inquiry and we do see this they're going to ask to see relevant documents they might ask to visit the site <laughs> if you're lucky right now because they don't seem to be very uh, interactive examining prototypes and final products talking to employees again you know they'll they Again, it used to be the case that you'd have a meeting with your competent professional the company in HMRC and just talk it through. Um, they would want to see project charts, drawings, designs, test results, photos of prototypes, minutes of meetings, email exchanges, or any other relevant records. So, um, you know, be prepared. They will ask for this sort of information. You know, milestones of you know, where you were in projects at certain times. They're already asking for this now where they do challenge claims. So this isn't new. But if you have that to hand and you're keeping it as you go along, I think it's going to be a uh, very worthwhile exercise. So another area that sort of deals with document, document in the advance. Interestingly, they have really shifted towards specifying uncertainties and a separate plan for resolving each one. And I've shifted and focused from a project seeking in advance towards a project seeking to resolve an uncertainty. And it's kind of an interesting shift. I think what the driver here is they're looking to move away from having like an overall it used to be that the advance led everything. So where is the technical advance? Where's the technological advance? Where's the scientific advance? And when you focus on an advance, it can be easier to, to make a project broader, so to make a, more of a project. That is the advance, so everything falls. All the sub-projects that fall within that then drive that advance and can make the, the claim larger, so to speak. I think here what they're trying to do is break down large projects into separate technical uncertainties first, and then what advance comes out of that. So I think they're looking to narrow the approach here. And, you know, kind of, I just made a note, I was looking through the guidance, and they provide a 13-step guide for steps to take before making a claim. And a lot of it's the usual stuff, you know, identify a project, um, you know, look for uh, where the technical advance is, 
get competent professional involved, yada, yada, yada. You, I'll, you, you can see the link to it. I'm not going through it now. But what's interesting, out of this 13-step guide, there's a massive focus on technical uncertainty to the extent that out of the 13 points, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 all mention the word uncertainty, whereas advance is mentioned twice in points 5 and 10. So that shows the extent to which uncertainty is now becoming the driver, identifying that technical uncertainty. It's going to be absolutely key. And I think, that, again, that is my view, that's approach to narrow the application. So in terms of the impact for companies, I think you know, just being able to follow this guidance and um, start applying it now to all projects. So in real time, you know, you, whatever account period you're in now, start documenting things much more clearly and getting the view of your competent software engineers, your competent engineers, your, you know, whoever it, your innovation leads in your companies to be able to apply it the um, write down the substantive bullet points about what they're doing, what the technical uncertainties are that they're looking to overcome and what advance will come out of that technical uncertainty. So how will it be faster, cheaper, quicker, whatever the kind of appreciable improvement that's going to come out of the work that you're doing that doesn't exist in the current um, uh, landscape is going to be absolutely key. As I say there, putting the competent professional clearly in the frame. Now on the competent professional, it's always been a requirement to have a competent professional that is the the kind of the fictional person which whose view really turns a case as to whether something's R and D or not. And you know, anecdotally at the moment we're seeing cases where HMRC caseworkers are kind of I think almost accidentally putting themselves forward as competent professionals when they seek to deny claims. So that's a whole different story. Um, and you know, the competent professional requirement is nothing new, but it's and certainly in case law, it's become increasingly important and it's become a turning point in cases where a, a suitable competent professional hasn't been available to give their view or um, or you know, certain individuals just haven't been the right competent professional, so to speak. So in terms of HMRC, you know, they, they give examples of competent professionals. Um, HMRC say they see a common error when identifying a competent professional. Having, this is their words, having worked in a field or having an intelligent interest alone does not make a person a competent professional. They must have enough knowledge and experience relevant to the qualifying project. In respect of their field of expertise, HMRC expect a competent professional to have all the following attributes. They must be knowledgeable about the relevant scientific or technological principles involved. They must be aware of the current state of knowledge in the field as a whole. Note, not just the company as a whole. They must have accumulated experience and have a successful track record. A competent professional may work for your company or they may not. They don't have to be an employee. Evidence of a competent professional. Again, this is their guidance. Good evidence may include one of the following examples. High level qualifications in the field alongside continuous professional development or a significant number of years experience working at a high level in the field or a good scientific publication record in the field or industry awards or other public recognition for contributions to the field. Now, in terms of the opinion of a competent professional, they reckon that a, um, a, they advise that an opinion of a competent professional should set out clearly and as far as possible without jargon. Firstly, the depth of the competent professional's knowledge and experience in the relevant field. Secondly, the current state of relevant knowledge in the field. So when the project started, what was the you know, current knowledge? Thirdly, what the advance in science or technology being sought is. Fourthly, why what is being sought is an advance in the field. And fourthly, how the advance relates to knowledge, capability or a mixture of the two. HMRC will give weight to an opinion offered by the company's competent professional, but further inquiry may still be needed, especially where the opinion omits information set out above. There may be differences of opinion between competent professionals in a particular field. Where the view taken is a legitimate one, reached by a competent professional, properly exercising expert judgment, then it will normally be acceptable. So really important, again, it's always been important, but you see now, we're going to documentation, specifying the technical uncertainty as specified by the competent professional within the company or externally are absolutely crucial. So there we have it. Uh, those are the new guidelines. Provide a link below so you can read in more detail. If you're doing R&D, highly recommend you read them. I mean, you've always got to read it. It's absolutely critical. I think HMRC will lean on this increasingly as their uh, focus, their, their continued focus and uh, effort really to shift the focus of R&D claims in the ways I've mentioned. So I hope you found that useful. My name is Steve Livingston and thanks for watching.